Have you ever lived in a house that started to fall down? I have. The first house I bought was a beautiful three-storied Accrington bricked, brick-built, black and white timbered six-bedroomed house in Staley Bridge. One day I noticed there's a crack in the front wall and it started to get bigger and bigger. I rang the local builder, Mr. Murray, and I said, Mr. Murray, there's a big crack in the wall. He said, oh, come and put up a telltale on it for you, Mr. Hall. Oh, I do, you don't need to, I told him. If you stand here long enough, you can actually see it moving. And it was. The builder was with me for two Christmases. But do you know why it fell down? Because of its foundations. And it was a big job. And not a pretty sight. Even the most beautiful buildings cannot stand without a good foundation. So this morning, I'd like us to look and think about good foundations in our lives. We've already sung that well-known children's chorus, The Wise Man Built His House. So my next text this morning, as you've probably already guessed, is that Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 that was read for us by Margaret. Do you remember my last sermon about saving faith? Well, this sermon is connected with that. Saving faith involves the whole person. His mind, his intellect and reasoning, his accepting of the full gospel of Jesus, his heart, his emotions, trusting and relying on the words of Jesus. But the big difference with saving faith and every other kind of faith is the feet. The will. Saving faith involves action. Doing something. It involves in committing yourself to Jesus. Here's a quote from Thomas Watson. Faith that saves one is di the distinguishing quality is obedience. Faith that saves has one distinguishing quality, obedience. The only sound evidence of saving faith. So my sermon this morning follows on from saving faith and its connection is obedience. Having believed, how should we now live as Christians? Again, this involves the whole person, the head, the heart, and the will. So let me ask you a question this morning, if I may. So what are you building your life upon? The rock? Or your own philosophy? The words of Jesus? Or Sam? In this parable of Jesus, he paints a vivid picture of two kinds of hearers. Those who are doers and those that just listen. In this parable, there are two kinds of builders. Wise builders and foolish. In this parable, there are two kinds of results. Good results and disastrous results. This passage from Matthew chapter 7 is, is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And it begins with the words, therefore, and just like Paul, the therefores are very important because they connect the passage we're about to read with the previous passages. Therefore, in the light of all that I've been saying, says Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, great teaching what should we do 
This is what you should do. You should be wise and do what I say. Jesus preached the world's greatest sermon. Some say that this is Jesus at his simplest and best. A moral teacher without dogma. Who can forget them? Because some of his sayings have passed into the English language. An eye for an eye. Salt of the earth. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Love your enemies. Do unto others. He'd have them do unto you. But this view of a simple moral teacher cannot stand up to close examination. It's mistaken on two counts. First, it ignores who, who it was that said it. And secondly, it's profound teaching. He redefined murder. Not only killing, but anger. He redefined adultery. Not only acts, but thoughts as well. He redefined, redefined divorce. Not for any old reason, but adultery. All these memorable subjects, prayer, fasting, worry, judging others, loving your enemies. But at the end of the sermon that Jesus had finished, he said these things. The crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as one of their teachers of the law. They'd never heard anything like it because he said, I tell you. They were absolutely amazed and flabbergasted as his teaching. Because Jesus' teaching was one that the Christian life is not only following a philosophy, not just a commitment to a set of moral codes, not teaching a set on good ideas. In this passage, Jesus says the Christian life is practical. It involves obeying the words of Jesus. It involves concrete actions. He sets before us a radical choice. Obedience or disobedience. Back to our passage, Jesus said in this parable, there's two kinds of hearers. The ones who really hear. Jesus said in Revelation, he said seven times, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. If you're really hearing, your head and your heart will be engaged like a lover reading a love letter. The head, the intellect and the understanding are all involved. A lover. He's the kind of person who thinks about what he's read. And what has been said? They really hear. The other kind of hearers is the one who just listens. Casually. Nothing sinks in. Just a sermon taster. Wasn't that a nice sermon? Oh, what he had good jokes to tell. He just listens. Nothing really sinks in. If there's two kinds of hearers, there's two kinds of builders. The wise build on the words of Jesus and he hides them in his heart so they won't sin. The man who hears Christian teaching puts it into practice what he hears. He's not just content to listen to exhortations, to repent and believe and live a life holy life the wise man actually repents and believes and lives a holy life the wise man actually abhors 
what is sinful. The wise man actually cleaves to what is good. The wise man actually learns to love the fellowship. He learns to love those who are outside. He even learns to love his enemies. Because he obeys what he hears. Another quote from Thomas Watson. Doers are the best hearers. It's hard work digging deep foundations for your life. It costs in labor and self-denial. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, One act of obedience is better than a hundred sermons. Do you believe that? But one act of obedience is better than listening to a hundred sermons. But the foolish builder just listens, happily, casually, going in one ear and going out the other. He's a man who hears Christian teaching and doesn't put it into practice because he's disobedient. A foolish man is content just to listen to exhortations, to repent and believe and live a holy life. The foolish man doesn't actually repent and believe and live a holy life. The foolish man doesn't actually learn to do what is well. The foolish man doesn't actually abhor sinful life. He doesn't actually cleave to what is good. He doesn't learn to love the fellowship or people outside. Or his enemies. He just sits there and does nothing about what he's heard. What costs us little is worth little. We all know what obedience is, and I don't not want to define it for you because we all know what it means. We just don't want to do it. Here's an anonymous quote. It costs us to follow Jesus, but it costs us more if we don't. It costs us all to follow Jesus, but it'll cost us more in the end if we don't. Jesus makes it impossible to be neutral. A definite decision has to be made. Am I going to obey it? Or disobey it. Obey what he says or ignore him. Cannot be neutral. The Christian life is an unconditional commitment of our lives to his teaching. Is there a broken relationship in your life? A fallout in your family or the fellowship. I, I, has someone really offended you and upset you? What do you do? Do you forgive them? Or do you refuse and wait till you feel like it? And if you know you've offended someone or upset them, what do you do? You go and tell them and ask them to forgive you? Or do you say, well, it serves them right. They deserved it anyway. When you're tempted to lie, do you? When you're tempted to get angry, do you? The difference between these two builders is not obvious on the, on the outside. They can both look the same. Two identical builders. Two identical buildings going up. They look the same on the outside, but the foundations can be very different. These things haven't changed in 2,700 years. In our Old Testament reading from Ezekiel, this is God talking to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 33, 
and verse 30. My people come to you, Ezekiel, as they usually do, and sit before you and listen to your words, but they don't put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Instead, to you, you're nothing more than a singer of love songs with a beautiful voice playing a lovely instrument. Well, well, they hear your words, but they don't put them into practice. Jesus said the same thing 700 years later. They listen to your words, but they don't put them into practice, said Jesus. When you're tempted to look lustfully, you look, or you do not look twice. There's two kinds of hearers, two kinds of builders. There's two kinds of results. Two people ostensibly living their everyday lives. But when trials come into their lives, the results can either be good or bad, happy or disastrous. Let me ask the question again. What are you going to do when the rains come down and the streams rise and the winds blow and beat against your life? What are you going to do? Because they surely will. How will you respond to sickness? How do you respond to sickness now? How will you respond when grief overwhelms you? Because they know, we know these things are going to happen in our lives. Are you ready? Have you been building well? Or when things go wrong, are you going to blame God and shake your fist at him and tell him he's got it wrong? Can you say with Paul, I know whom I believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to make all grace bound to me. A wise man's soul stands firm. His religion doesn't fail him. His faith doesn't fail and fall away. Because his foundations have been obtained with much labour and tears, many days wrestling, much study and prayer. His labours were not wasted because he heaps up a, re a rich reward. His religion stands firm. You know, I was once asked by my pastor, a good few years ago now, Adji said, what are you going to do? if you get a terminal illness? Or what are you going to do if you have to live in an old folks home? What will you do? Will you know how to trust in the Lord? Lean on him and not on your own understanding? Will you know how to remind yourself of the glory that's to be to reveal? Can you say with Paul, God is working together all good in my life. In the future, how are you going to cope with illness, with temptation? Or are you going to give in or stand firm? After my pa pastor asked me that question years ago, the very next tragedy that happened in my life. Do you know what I discovered? That in the time of need, God gives the strength. Because we cannot know beforehand how we're going to cope. We cannot know the answer to that question, how am I going to cope? But in, in the tragedy, in the, God gives the grace.
How are you over, going to overcome evil in your life? By crying about it? How are you going to overcome it? In all these things, Jesus sets before us a radical choice. Obedience or disobedience. Let me conclude. When you hear a sermon or read a scripture, do you take it to heart? Do you take it seriously or flippantly? Does it sink deep into your heart and life and affect the way you live? Or does it go in one ear and out the other? You, you may have been very fortunate in this life and led, led a charmed life with no big crises or disasters have befallen you. So thank the Lord. Because there is a trial coming. A big one. And it's for us all. We are told that in that day, we'll have to give an account to God for what we've done in the flesh. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say of me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. How frightening is that? Many will say, Lord, Lord, I read the Bible every day. Lord, Lord, I said my prayers every week. Many will say, Lord, Lord, I always give a tithe of my money. Many will say, Lord, Lord, I tried my very, very best. But... Jesus says, did you do the will of my Father? And did, it, and did you do it every day? Because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Are you sure that your foundations are on the rock? Let's pray.